When I set out at the start of this project, I seriously wondered if I'd be able to find many people at all who were willing to come forward and record their memories of the coronation. But I needn't have worried. The response has been truly incredible. All sorts of local people have very kindly related their stories to me and every single story has been different. Some people were actually in London and saw the royal procession with their own eyes. Michael Shuttleworth gave us a detailed account of the Royal Review of the Fleet. To find people that were in Africa at the time of King George VI's death was way more than I ever dared hope for. But Elizabeth's account of her father actually officiating at a private service of worship for Princess Elizabeth and Prince Philip is a wonderful bonus for us all, something I hadn't even imagined. And there's still more to come. I'm going to play you a Zoom conversation with somebody, believe it or not, who had access to the royal family on the momentous occasion of this coronation. My thanks to Martin Robinson, who's managed to obtain special permission for us to broadcast this conversation, which is coming up right now. Ladies and gentlemen, here is none other than His Grace, the Duke of Devonshire. So we're here to talk about the coronation. I've, I've got just a few short questions. It'd be great to hear what, uh, what you have to say about your involvement. But firstly, what are your memories of the coronation? You were nine years old, I think. Yes, I was just nine. I, I, um, and that was three years younger than Paige. I was a page to my grandmother, my father's mother, and she was mistress of the robes, which is a sort of senior um, helper to, to Her Majesty. Well, Princess Elizabeth, and then the Queen, uh, and then she became Queen on the on the coronation day. Um, and because my grandmother assured, I suppose the Duke of Norfolk, who arranged the whole coronation, assured him that I would behave myself uh, and not be embarrassing for anybody. I was allowed to be the page to her, to my grandmother, um, although I was three years younger than the limit. So I was really the youngest person with an active part to play. Um, Prince Charles and I think Princess Anne were there, but as spectators, but I can't think of anybody else that young who was there. There were lots of other pages, but they were 12 years old or, or, or older. So, so, well, quite a privilege, I would imagine. To, yes, uh, to, it, to it was an enormous privilege. And I was aware of that, I think. Um, one of the wonderful things about it was I was at boarding school and I didn't like it at all. And because there were a lot of rehearsals, uh, every time there was a rehearsal, I had to come to London for the whole day. So it meant a day away from the school, which I didn't like a bit. So that was an added bonus. It sounds like it. I'm sure plenty of school children would have enjoyed a day away from yeah, school. Yeah, absolutely. So, well, it, so how did you travel there? Did you? Well, that's the thing I really remember most. Um, uh, my parents had a house in Mayfair in a place called Chesterfield Street, near Curzon Street. And my father had arranged for the, the state carriage. I'm not sure the correct term. But anyway, the, the, the Cavendish Devonshire family coach to come down from Chatsworth, I imagine on a low loader or something, uh, and with horses from the local brewery up in Derbyshire and coachmen in uniform, which must have been made for them, and they were going to take us um, from Chesterfield Street, from this little house in Mayfair, um, to uh, Westminster Abbey. And so at some unearthly hour, like six o'clock in the morning, there we were dressed up in all our, my father and mother in their robes and me and my pages kit, which included wearing suspenders and stockings, which for a nine-year-old boy was quite embarrassing. I was terrified some of my school friends would find out that I was wearing, anyway, um, we were there, and there's a photograph of us in the doorway, and the carriage arrived, the coach arrived, and we set off, and um, there, there, of course there were huge crowds in London, and um, they, some of them had been sleeping out along the route for two or three days to get a good place, and they were just beginning to wake up, and um, 
So we got some sort of rather jeery cheers, um, uh, sort of slightly sarcastic, I think, quite reasonably, this rather old-fashioned appearance of this coach with his, these two men behind in uniform in sort of 18th century uniform. Anyway, we, we set off, and I remember going down uh, St. James's, St. James's Street, which is, you don't realise how steep it is until you yeah. go down it with a horse and carriage, or two horses and carriage. And we were overtaken by, I think it was the Marcus of Bar. He was, and his carriage was, the horses were cantering. He was going really fast. And that was quite a, a scary moment. After that, the next thing that I remember was that we got completely lost because the coachman and his assistant, I don't think he'd ever been to London. There was no reason why they should have been. They certainly hadn't driven around the streets of London with all the sort of everything cordoned off. And so my, there was no way of speaking to them except by hanging out of the window and shouting round the, sort of round the front. And so my father, in all his robes and everything, he didn't wear, have his coronet on, thank goodness, but um, had to, and of course that amused the crowd no end because I think we were behind what was then called the Army and Navy Stores, which is quite close to where we were going, but it wasn't the right place. Anyway, we eventually arrived. The coach was built for two people to sit, but because I was little, I was squished in between my parents. And the way we arrived, the door opened on my father's side, so he got out. And to my horror, there was this terrible tearing noise. My sword, my little sword, we got caught in the in, in the lining of his um, robes and ripped all the lining out. Oh, God. And it just show, shows, um, so he, he, none of us were, I was horrified. My father wasn't very pleased. Um, um, but just to show how well organized everything was, almost before his foot had landed on the pavement out below the coach, there was a, a person there with a needle and thread uh, to sew it back together again. They thought about all that. They thought about everything. Anyway, so that was that was um, that, and then I went. I was whisked off um, with my grandmother, and my parents went wherever they went to. to they was, and um, I, I, of course, I by then we rehearsed six or seven times, and although it was different because there was many more people, um, uh, I, it, it it wasn't it wasn't too scary. We, we and so when the procession formed up quite a long time later, we had to be there an hour and a half or something before it actually started. The Queen obviously was at the front and then she had her train held by six maids of honor, three on each side. And then behind the Queen, behind the Queen's train was my grandmother and then just me holding her train. And in lots of the movies and the photographs, you see the Queen and the maids of honor and my grandmother. And then usually I'm cut off. Out of it. But anyway, I was there, so <laughs> that that was fine. And then we went to our places in the in the in the. Um, and I do remember going up the aisle in in Westminster Abbey, how close everybody seemed. Um, uh, all these huge people, or it seemed to me my, my memory mostly men, but there must have been a lot of women as well, very close to where we were walking, and. Um, and I suppose it was quite a narrow space, but that was a shock to me. Um, and so then the, the service proceeded and the most difficult thing I had to do was at one stage, my grandmother walked out with me holding her train behind her uh, to, to help the queen, some part of the ceremony, I don't exactly know what, take something away from the, I don't know, uh, so we went forward, and that's quite easy. You have to keep the sort of pressure of the train more or less the same, not too tight, not too loose. But then my grandmother had to walk backwards to get back to her place. And obviously, revert, she couldn't turn around because that would be not right. So I had to get my hands under the train and and hold it so that she didn't trip over it. And uh, that was quite nerve wracking. Um, but anyway, we managed that all right. And then I, I, I do remember the noise of um, when, when the queen was actually crowned and the crown was put on her head. 
And then everybody said, God save the Queen, incredibly loudly. Everybody in the Abbey, and I think the doors were open. In my memory, I could hear the outside, but I don't know whether that's really true. And that was really my, I don't know how we got back home. I know I went off very, quite late on, very hungry, sort of two o'clock, three o'clock in the afternoon. And I suppose eventually I must have found my parents somewhere. But it was, um, it was, of course, I've seen lots of the films and things, and, um, but uh, we didn't see any of the procession. And I think your father was there, wasn't he? Well, as, yeah, as we were discussing just before we started this, my father was doing his national service uh, in Egypt, actually, with the RAF. And he was, um, he was called back to come and attend the coronation to help keep the crowds at bay and to line the route with, <laughs> with, with part, of, part of his, um, well, with his colleagues from the RAF. It just seemed quite something to bring them back from Egypt to do yeah. that, but that, that's what they did. So, uh, yeah, fa fantastic um, experience for him, but not, not quite as involved as yours. Uh, and no, and not quite as comfortable because I think it rained a bit, didn't it? It, it um, did. I understand. Yeah, yeah. That, that his his recollection was that it rained a fair bit. Um, yeah. and 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 you know he had to stand there in of course, yes, in, yeah. in looking looking the part. Yeah, and and there was all the, the service people lining the routes, and then a huge parades of of all the forces from all over. He, the the Commonwealth. The Commonwealth, you, yes, absolutely. I think that's yeah. right. Um, and of course, the army was much, much bigger then than it is now. So yeah. that must have been an extraordinary experience being, because there was lots of other people arriving by carriages, wasn't there? But, my understanding, I did a little bit of research. My understanding, I think there was something in the order of 150 carriages. Does that sound right? Really? Yeah, well, I've no idea. That I mean, I'm not surprised, but that must. So it, it was plenty going on for your father to watch. <laughs> must have been a. It must. I mean, the, the as you said, the Duke of Norfolk has the distinguished responsibility of organising these things. So uh, sounds like uh, he did a particularly good job. <laughs> well, he he did think of everything, and I know that at one stage somebody said, um, "What happens if it rains? We'll need umbrellas to get people from outside the abbey." So, and he he said because he was also in charge of Ascot Racecourse at the same time. Right. He said, well, there's hundreds of umbrellas in the left luggage part of Ascot Racecourse. So they got all the left behind umbrellas from Ascot and they brought them down for people to use to get from wherever they were going. He thought of everything. Uh, well, but the needle and thread was brilliant, I thought. Well, look, look, well I, th thank you for sharing that experience, Stoker. That's, it, it's amazing to hear, it really is. And, um, you know, I, I doubt there are... There are many more people who can give us give as good a version of what went on as that. So, well, I wish I, of course, like always, I wish I'd written it down, but I didn't. Yeah, well, at, at nine years old, I don't yeah. think you could be expected to think to do that. Um, I think in, well, c clearly big celebrations coming up, um, coming up as in, in a month or, well, in, in, in a little period of time. What are the plans uh, to celebrate the Jubilee? What are your plans to celebrate the Jubilee and what are chats with? Well, they're the same. We'll, we'll be at home. We'll be here at Chatsworth. And I think that the celebrations will be very local, like they have been for past jubilees. Uh, we'll have a bonfire uh, on what we call the Crobs, which is the hill between Chatsworth House and Enza Village. Yeah. And it's a sort of traditional place for celebratory bonfires. And um, so we'll, we'll have that for the local community. Um, and there'll be some food and drink probably beforehand because it won't get dark till quite late, will it? Yeah. In yeah. June, about as late as it gets. And then we'll light the bonfire and that'll be that. And it'll be lovely. It'll be fairly low key, but um, traditional. And somebody told me they were hoping to organise a street party in Enza village. And no doubt there will be in the other villages. But I think it'll all be local and we'll be part of that. Do you know, I, th I think we're probably up there, Stoker. That's just been been the greatest, <laughs> the greatest story. I mean, we we swapped some. Well, you told me some stories in the in the last couple of interviews, which have been brilliant, and that that really ranks up there. <laughs> yeah, absolutely superb. Yeah. So I, it was a great privilege, and um, you know, I'm, I'm very lucky to do it. I even got a medal, which I still wear. So I don't know whether the Prince of Wales has got one too. I expect he has, but he got rather more than I have. I've only really got that one. Ha, 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 ha.